moving, get moving. Oh, I'm supposed to be there. Oh, sorry, sorry. Get moving, get moving. Oh, good, good. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, was, I was trying to get moving. How do you guys get moving? Um, we're all different, right? We all get moving in different ways. We all have different challenges. And I think what's important is that we celebrate and we embrace those challenges. We embrace our differences. And I'd like to start by sharing a little bit about how I came to be here today. I've been passionate about ambulation and communication all my life. Now for me, ambulation just isn't walking like I just did. It's also swimming or scuba diving or surfing or rock climbing or, or what else, it's other things. For me, it's important to see what I can do with what I have, my body. What can I make of my body? What can I make of the gifts that I have? Instead of looking at what I don't have, let's see if I can maximize what I have. And so that's what I've tried to do for my entire life. And along the way, I figured I may have something to talk about. I may have something to share. I may have something to paint and communicate with other people. So I became a writer, and I became a painter, and I became a speaker. And so that's just communicating and trying to share something that I think might be important. So as, a, as a, an athlete, I started when I was a kid, you know, and I just started playing baseball. You know, I played baseball like this, and I played kick the can like that. And, I, you know, I played the way I played, you know. I was playing against you guys, and you let me play with you. That was cool, you know. But um, I wasn't always as good as you were. But it, and it wasn't until uh, I learned about the Paralympics that I could compete with people similar to myself in the physical conditions. And so I had a long career as a swimmer in the Paralympics. I swam in three Paralympics around the world. And I swam all over the world, uh, competing for my country. And, uh, I did a Honolulu Marathon. I did that in 16 hours. I came in dead last. Um, but that was, that was, I just wanted to see if I could do it. And when I retired from sp swimming competitively, I had to find something else to do. So I was offered the chance to do an Ironman event. And that's what you just saw. That was in Korea. Um, so... Again, it's just trying to, to see what I could do with this body, you know, how far can I take it? So the communication thing, the art thing, I started painting and drawing when I was five, and um, I started doing comics. I like comics, and I figured, why, why do I have to buy comic books? I can draw my own comic books, you know? I was, I was always cheap, you know, I was always very cheap. But, uh, uh, and as I grew as an artist, I started to draw and do different things, and my first, one of some of my first drawings, you know, when I was a kid, you paint what's important, right? What's important in life? What's important? Movies, candy, and staying, now staying at very nice hotels. And so, as I grew, as, I, as an artist, I changed. I started to do a lot of pen and ink, you know, rapidographs, really fine, fine thing. And I, I used to go to restaurants, and instead of giving the waitresses tips, because I was so cheap, I would give them drawings. And they loved that, you know, that was just very cool. So I started drawing and drawing and drawing, I kept drawing, kept drawing. And then, you know, I started to do the nude. Uh, the story about this is funny. Uh, first year in college, Franklin and Marshall, a little Amish town in the middle of uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, figure drawing. So the 20 of the students sitting around in a circle. The teacher comes in, introduces us on the first day. Hi, and um, thank you for coming to this class. Now I'd like to introduce you to, to Sally. And Sally comes out to the middle of the room, and she's wearing a white bathrobe, you know? Um, and she comes out to the middle of us. We're all in the circle. She comes to the middle of the room. She stands on this little orange thing here, like, kind of like this. And she takes off her robe. <laughs> oh, my God. And she's stark naked, you know? And I go, wow, I think I'm in the right place here. So later, you know, you grow as an artist, you grow as a person, you want to keep changing, right, reinventing yourself. So I did the figure, and then it was like, how can the figure express something that I want to express, like sports, like running a marathon, like swimming? And then gradually you do other things. You, uh, when I came, in 1984, I got accepted into a San Jose State program to study Chinese arts in Taiwan. And that was great, because I got out of America, I got to Asia for the first time, and I was studying with local masters, a woman named Liang Danfeng, and I had this Chinese calligraphy teacher, you know. I thought, oh, it's just the brush, you know, he's just got the best brush, and that's why he can do it. You know, but he was like 75 years old, spoke no English, uh, and, but it was, it was a great learning experience, and, and I learned it wasn't just about the brush, it's how you use it. So I've, for the last 30 years, I've been traveling around the world, doing what I call expeditions and exhibitions. So I actually go places, I sit on the ground, I sit in the dirt, I get surrounded by people. This constantly happens, especially in China and India for that matter. But you know, you'll be drawing, you'll be sitting there minding your own business and suddenly someone will come up and start critiquing your painting. 
And I thought, well, don't you have something better to do? You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just hanging out painting, you know. So I sit in the dirt, sit around and paint. And um, it's really kind of amazing to, to become part of a culture, to become part of this, wherever you are, sitting there absorbing the sights, the smells, the sounds of where you are. And that becomes part of you and it becomes part of your paintings. So recently I've done these artist in residencies where, I, get me wrong, this is pretty amazing. I get invited to a five-star resort where I get to go and live for a month and then I get to paint and I get to hang out with people and things like this. And then I sit and sketch them. How cool is that, you know? And then I go away and I go back to the surface and I paint them, you know? So that, that's just kind of amazing. So I've been able to do this all my life and I thought, wow, now that's moving. That's, that's living big, you know? Because when you're a kid, you think, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I thought, oh, I like doing art, but my parents thought I'd be the president of the United States because, you know, FDR, he had polio too. <laughs> so anyway, I like being an artist and I started doing different themes. And this was a theme I started to call portals, you know, doorways, entryways, going from one place of your life into another place, you know? So going through portals, going through doorways, more doorways, more collage, start to collage and layer things in. And then I started telling stories, telling stories about stuff. Well, how, how cool is this? So here's a painting. You get up on the left side. You go up the steps. You go through life. It's like a washing machine, right? You go through, grow through. And then you, you hit a wall. You hit something in the middle where that black line is. You see where that red X is? That's like a TEDx preparation, you know? Get ready for TEDx. And then but you get through TEDx, right? You survive it, you know? And then you carry on, and you finish the race, and you get the, you know, you get the flag there. So the, kind of telling stories. And then I got onto this thing called the hero's journey. Anybody read Joseph? Joseph Campbell, The Hero's Journey. Anybody read it? Any? Pretty amazing stuff, right? The monomyth. Instead of telling you about it, I'm gonna, there's a little video I'm going to show you that kind of explains what the hero's journey is, and I'll be right back. What do Harry Potter, Katniss Everdeen, and Frodo all have in common with the heroes of ancient myths? What if I told you they are all variants of the same hero? Do you believe that? Joseph Campbell did. He studied myths from all over the world and published a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, retelling dozens of stories and explaining how each represents the monomyth or hero's journey. So what is the hero's journey? Think of it as a cycle. The journey begins and ends in the hero's ordinary world, but the quest passes through an unfamiliar, special world. Along the way, there are some key events. Think about your favorite book or movie. Does it follow this pattern? Status quo, that's where we start. One o'clock, call to adventure. The hero receives a mysterious message, an invitation, a challenge. Two o'clock, assistance. The hero needs some help, probably from someone older, wiser. Three o'clock, departure. The hero crosses the threshold from his normal, safe home and enters the special world and adventure. We're not in Kansas anymore. Four o'clock, trials. Being a hero is hard work. Our hero solves a riddle, slays a monster, escapes from a trap. Five o'clock, approach. It's time to face the biggest ordeal, the hero's worst fear. Six o'clock, crisis. This is the hero's darkest hour. He faces death and possibly even dies, only to be reborn. Seven o'clock, treasure. As a result, the hero claims some treasure, special recognition or power. Eight o'clock, result. This can vary between stories. Do the monsters bow down before the hero, or do they chase him as he flees from the special world? Nine o'clock, return. After all that adventure, the hero returns to his ordinary world. 10 o'clock, new life. This quest has changed the hero. He has outgrown his old life. 11 o'clock, resolution. All the tangled plot lines get straightened out. 12 o'clock, status quo, but upgraded to a new level. Nothing is quite the same once you're a hero. Nothing's quite the same once you're a hero. So we've all got these cycles in our lives that we go through. And to break it down more simply, we kind of start at home, right? Where we are, status quo. And then we, care, we decide we got to change something. We got to make a decision to move, to do something, to go somewhere, to change something. So we go, we depart, 
We start on some kind of a journey, some kind of an adventure. We carry on, and somewhere along that adventure, we have some initiation, some challenge. We meet something, or we learn something, we find something. And then, once we found it, once we're refreshed or figure out what it was we came for, we go home. We return. We carry on. We go back to our fam family and friends, our country, and we say, tell people and share with people what we did. So for me, I did this bunch of paintings about it. I did paintings, like this one's called Home, and here I was in California, living the dream, living in the Mahatma Gandhi Yoga Ashram on a mountain. That was cool. But it was like, it was cool, too cool. It was like I had to do something. So I left America. I went to Taiwan to study. I departed. I departed. I left. I started a new journey. I, as I told you, I studied art with Liang Danfeng in Taipei. And that got me into Asia, into a whole new adventure. Along the way, there were initiations. I went traveling through China, Nepal, India, Pakistan, all overland, all backpacking by myself. So you were, there was like a lot of days and months and on trains and doing a lot of different things. Eventually, I returned. I went home. I went back to my country. I had exhibitions of my paintings. I taught children what I had learned and how to paint overseas when sitting in the dirt. Well, these people are giving critiques. So, what about you? What about your lives? Where are you right now? Is it time for you to depart? Is it, are you in the middle of some initiation? Is it home? Are you home? Is it deciding to change? Deciding, making your intention clear. What is it you want to do? Where do you want to go? Have you taken the first step? Because, you know, if you take the first step, the second one's always easier. Initiation, accepting challenges along the way. It's not, it's not going to be all easy, but that's why you go on the journey, to learn and get to these challenges. And fourth, after you've won, the bone, the boon, the, the medals, you've learned something, you go back, you inspire other people, you inspire yourself by having completed what you set out to do. Last year I did a trek in India with a friend of mine named Paul. Paul Fairhurst was riding his bike on Holland Road three years ago and he crashed and he broke his neck. I'm going to run over with time and they're going to hate me for this, but I'm going to show you this one little video real quick. I'm Gregory Burns. 56 years ago, I was paralyzed by polio from the waist down. I'm Paul Fairhurst. I'm a C567 incomplete quadriplegic. I went out cycling one morning. I flew over the handlebars, and I landed on my head here. The date of the injury, I had a less than 10% chance of ever walking again. I recall our first meeting was at a party. You walked in, and I noticed that you had a little bit of a limp, and I thought, hmm, this guy and I are kind of in the same camp. So I felt emboldened to ask you what happened, and you shared with me what had happened. And then as soon as you said, Johnny Walker, my mind said, keep walking. Then I said, wow, we should keep walking together. We've come full circle a year later. We're going off to the deck. It's going to be a lot more challenging than I think I thought it would be. I don't think anything prepares you for this. I think this is just something else. Trying to get my body through the level of pain that I encounter, I mean, that hurt. It's an enormous amount of work. It's a huge physical demand. I think this is the hardest thing Paul has done since his accident. He's never climbed the mountains he has on this. And I have a tremendous respect for the discipline, the training, the mindset that he's had to get himself to the starting line of this trail. You said Rocky Outcrop? Yeah. We walked directly below those crags right there and top out the prayer flags in about an hour's time. Paul and I walk a similar track, a similar journey. And I've never had anybody so close to share with and It's been like two logs on a fire, bouncing off each other ideas and philosophies and thoughts and feelings that have exposed some of the insight that we've gathered through our lives. Three years after a spinal cord injury that left me paralyzed from the shoulders downwards and with no sensation or very little, facing a prognosis of a very bleak future, after three years of extraordinary hard work, I walked 35 kilometers at high altitude in very difficult terrain sometimes. You know, on this track, I've come to understand how strong this thing has made me become. That's three years. <sighs> I 
knew the finish line was coming. I hadn't actually stopped to think about how it would feel when I got there. Being together, sharing that moment, and both of us soul searching, both of us on our own journeys. And that's who I am now. That's, that's what my life is about now, after this injury. I will find a way to live life with exceptional experiences that in whatever way either inspire people or give them hope. I knew that before we came, but I know it even more now. To me, mentorship is about imparting wisdom gained through experience. The mentor owns it and shares that experience with someone so that possibly they can own that wisdom or that understanding. I don't think I'll ever forget this experience. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I learned a lot from Paul on that trip, and I think we learned a lot from each other. And, and in closing, I'd like to say from Paul and myself, we all have different challenges. We're all different in many ways. <clears throat> but what we need all to do is not to be limited by our limitations. Thank you very much. <clears throat>